everybody and welcome to JARG, the podcast that brings you education and information on endometriosis and adenomyosis. I'm joined again by the very first guest that I had on the podcast, but on a totally different topic this evening. I'd like to welcome Orla O'Connor back onto the JARG podcast. Orla, how is things with you today? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for having me again, Kathleen. <laughs> so Orla, it's... what we are going to chat about this evening is is linked, I suppose, to our first conversation, which is around advocacy and the cross-border directive and, you know, the work that you do for, for people with, living with endometriosis in Ireland. And you're another one of these amazing women with endometriosis who have had to sort of pick themselves up, regardless of what's going on between family life, work life, um, pain, all the health issues, and go back to college and, you know, more or less start a whole different set of juggling on top of all your pain and everything else that's going along. So can you tell me a little bit about your, first of all, your decision um, to go back to college and uh, what you're studying as well? Yeah, so I, after I had uh, my surgery um, with Dr. Mitroy in Romania, that was two and a half years ago, of September 21. Um, and okay. after that, I was, prior to going back to college, I was a pizza chef for almost 10 years. Um, and I always stayed that was kind of my first love. I've always loved cooking and I stayed in that. And uh, I had really good employers and people who really took care of me, understood, didn't fully understand endometriosis, but were willing to understand and knew um, they just helped me so much. They they helped support me in my job and they totally understood when I needed to take time off. Um, very physical job, um, but always were understanding. I've always been very, very supported by them. Um, still friends with them now, very close friends. Um, so I started doing that. And when I had my surgery in 21, again, they were very supportive of, of that. Uh, helped me financially, helped me emotionally. They were, they're, they're very good people. Um, and when I, after I had that surgery, I always felt like I wanted to do more for the endometriosis community, but particularly in Ireland. Um, so after I had my surgery and I felt well and I was doing really well and everything, I sadly decided to leave that job. Um, but I had researched um, programs in Ireland um, around what I would look, what, what I'd be looking to do f- to help the endometriosis, endometriosis community in Ireland. So uh, first I started looking at social work, actually. Um, and I had a look into that, but because of my kids, and just family life at home, it's very difficult program to take on because you do so many placements through all the years and, you know, a lot of people travel abroad and stuff. And I just didn't have the time to give that what I needed. Um, and I had spoken to a couple of different social workers and I'm I'm just that bit older. Um, so it's not, it wasn't really the career path for me just when I kind of looked into it. So the program that I looked into in UCC, which again, I had to choose kind of close to home and I had to be UCC or MTU in Cork um, because I have kids and a family and I couldn't travel um, any further away from Cork. So I chose, I was actually researching programs at UCC, um, but I really looked into public health um, and UCC is the only university in the country that does this program, which is the Bachelor of Science public health sciences degree. Um, There are a couple of other ones like Watford started one, which is public health and health promotion. Um, And then there's a number of masters. You can take your masters in public health in a number of different universities. But I really researched this program. I like researched every module and really looked into the book of modules when I was researching it, see if I wanted to do it. And it was just, it's a really, really broad program bringing in a number of different, um, like the health sector is a massive one, but also science. Um, and I've always been kind of creative, but also science as well. So I like the mix of this program and what it does, because we do take, you know, we do epidemiology and we do stats and statistics and uh, we do microbiology. And so we're in the lab a little bit. And then you have the likes of like health promotion, uh, social research, all of those things kind of mixed together. So I just like the mix of the program um, and it's a very small course as well. So there's only about 32 of us or so. Um, and I, to be honest, I forgot to check as well, but I don't know how long it's running there, but there have been graduates already. So it has been there for a number of years. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I chose it, why I took it on. Yeah. 
And it's it's brilliant to see that like your endometriosis has really informed your decision as opposed to holding you back or, or you know, turning you off and sort of doing anything health related, which is absolutely brilliant. So for those of us who aren't really familiar with what the role of public health is, can you tell me a little bit more about it and how you would see that, um, you know, sort of being a help to the endometriosis community in Ireland? Yeah, so I think it's always really funny because people are always like, oh, what are you doing in college? And I'm like, oh, public health. They're like, oh, so you're going to be a public health nurse. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's not what it is. And it is something that's, uh, I guess, because it is so broad, it's really hard to get a, a proper definition of it. Um, and, you know, the WHO would have a definition and then there's all these other groups that would have a definition. But I really like one, um, which is like the Atchison Report. And it just says, that public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life and promoting health through the organized efforts of society, Um, which I think like I think I've always really liked that quote just because it really particularly for endometriosis, because it's not just, you know, you have biomedical models and all of this, like it's everything like it's kind of treated as an acute illness. Um, And, you know, it's not recognized as one of the chronic illnesses or a chronic condition. It's not recognized as that. Even though, I mean, when you talk about like non-communicable diseases and stuff like that, it could be, you know, kind of grouped into that, but obviously not recognized. So they, you know, you don't put it in like that, even though it is a chronic disease. Um, so yeah, and public health is like, you know, um, access to healthcare, um, ensuring that the entire population has access to appropriate and cost-effective healthcare. Um, so, you know, it is pr- protection, prevention, promotion. So you are promoting health and then prolonging the lives and improving quality of life for people. Um, and then you have things like legislation and policies and working with stakeholders and using it as a, a holistic approach, like it's supposed to be a, a, a holistic, multidisciplinary, multifactorial approach. Like, And it's including all of the things like social determinants of health, because those are huge and and they affect so much and so many different health conditions, like barriers to care, access to healthcare services, um, equality, equity, all of those things, you know, um, and governance and policies and accountability and assurance. Um, and, you know, be able to work with all of those things together. Um, and I really took a pull on it because advocacy is a huge part of that. Um, it would fall into health promotion, but I actually see it as a broader thing with advocacy because I think you need to have the epidemiology. I think you need to have this, the research. I think you have to be able to read those studies and interpret them correctly. Um, and and it's where people kind of get lost, um, you know, where the lay person kind of gets lost because they, you know, you know, media sensationalizes studies. So it's like, oh, French fries um, in preschoolers can cause breast cancer. So, I mean, you you know, but if you, you know, if you really look at those studies and kind of make them even lay them out simply, like, you know, like Kate from Inno Girls blog, break them down really well to say, you know, it's actually this, you know, this easy, if you know where you're kind of pulling from. Um, And then there's loads of different types of research, you know, as well, like you have qualitative, quantitative, like you've done that yourself um, in your own research. So, you know, and, and people don't understand that, like the qualitative research is about people's answers and how they feel at its subjective. It's like how people feel about a certain thing or the way that they feel affected in a healthcare system. And then quantitative is based off of data and numbers, which we don't have a lot of, um, particularly in endometriosis and particularly in Ireland. Uh, we don't have any data, but um, so hopefully, I mean, my, I would really hope to do something in like that. I love numbers and statistics and I love pulling data and doing data analysis and research. Um, So advocacy, yeah, it's definitely huge. It's supposed to be a people-centered approach, um, education of the public, uh, you know, health equity, which is, you know, it's a bit different from equality in that you're trying to put everyone on the same level, you know, and that, everyone can see over the fence at the same time, but at the same level. Um, and that's something that there's really great concepts and frameworks for, but nobody's actually implemented them. Um, so there's a real lack of that and there's a real lack of understanding and it prevents like so many barriers to care for people. Um, 
and they just make it really, really difficult, you know. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the basis of, of public health. Like you could go on for hours, but <laughs> I know, and it is, and, and like the first thing that comes to mind when I hear public health, like I think of, you know, the infectious diseases, I think of, you know, yep. some of the disease prevention as well too. But the scope is absolutely massive, isn't it? Yep. And I think the potential there for bringing endometriosis into all of that is is very important. And I'm going to paraphrase one of our favorite advocates um, when, you know, Heather has often said that, you know, endometriosis needs to be treated like the next public health crisis. And I think that sort of carries a lot of weight. And I've seen other people sort of, um, you know, paraphrase and reuse this phase as well. Maybe without thinking the potentials of that. And it's not that we want to catastrophize the disease, but what we need to make sure is that there's a greater public awareness, there's an education, um, you know, sort of stream around that, not just for the, the you know, the, those people who live with it, but the general public as well, because it's very important that everybody can recognize the signs and symptoms. Absolutely. You... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And it has, you know, I think you have to change um you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to, to change attitudes in society. And there is that huge stigma and taboo and shame and all of that around endometriosis, you know, and around pain and around, you know, women's pain and all, you know, and in Ireland, it's so like all of that. And it's historical, you know, mm-hmm. it's historical and cultural in Ireland. And, um, you know, it's that patriarchy. I mean, we've had all that in history for years and it's still there. Like it's, you can see it all the time. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's like uh, nobody and nobody wants to ask or nobody wants to give you the information and everything in Ireland is like the secret. It's like, oh, we have this information, but I'm not going to tell you. You have to find it out for yourself, you know, um, you know, and that's why, you know, people sharing their stories, even for other things, you know, not just random injuries, but literally, you know, other stuff is that, when you share those stories, people start to learn. Like they'll even just do a Google search. Like if you hear something, it's like, oh, let me just have a look there. Or they'll check their social media and like check the tag or search the tag or, you know, and th- and that's how people find out about stuff, um, which is so wrong, you know, because you don't have, it should be a public awareness campaign from governments and all that stuff as well. But, you know, and people and and governments and the healthcare system. I mean, they need to start listening to people, to to their customer because we are their customer because the public is their customer. Um, and how can they work properly and treat those people accordingly if you don't ask them? You know, um, like or why they can't take responsibility and accountability for not knowing enough. And that's okay to say, I don't have the skill or I don't know, but look, I'm going to help you find the answer and we'll get there together. Um, But that's not the way it works, you know. Um, Like there's this huge emphasis as well on on PPI, you know, patient involvement, Mm -hmm. which they speak about. And I've had loads of lectures on PPI, but it's not actual reality at all. Like nobody's asking patients, nobody's asking anything like that it's actually the same in schools like you know my son is 16 and he says you know mom like some of the rules like you just don't like you know don't like and they don't get on and everything and I'm like you know it's so weird like because you're just like why don't teachers or the people making the policies ever ask the students you know how they feel or how and then they could work together you know to change things or you know all of that it's like ask the people who are living in that environment and who live that life that's who you need to ask um, and and then see it for what it is, you know. Definitely, it is, and it's and just when you mentioned, you know, the, the lack of data in Ireland as well too. And for market within the health service, like we have a huge amount of data silos that are not connected and not accessible. And you know, we're we're miles away from a single health record here. We're miles away from you know a single anything record. And that in itself, you know, is such a disadvantage because you you can't get the stats. We don't know how many people have been hospitalized for endometriosis. We don't know how many people have had laparoscopies. We don't know how many people have been diagnosed. We don't know how many people have had hysterectomies for their adenomyosis. We have no idea. Um, yeah. And all we can go is on best estimates. And you mentioned there, you know, again, about that very important thing of sharing stories and sharing experiences. But you're right, when you leave it to the public to have to manage their own public health campaigns, unfortunately, that can wander into to absolute crazy territory as well because you've got extreme experiences on both sides. Um, and while it's nice to have balance, 
some person might only hear the one extreme um, and then maybe like, you know, not get enough accurate information. And not everybody has that sort of health literacy as well to actually maybe go off and do that extra reading. I think that's one of the things that's quite important in public health as well is making that information quite accessible to people um, and in a way that's very easily understood and easily delivered as well. I think that's back to the sort of equity, isn't it? When you look at not just making information, I suppose, available and accessible and easily read, but access to the healthcare services. And one of the things in this country is we have like a multi-tier healthcare system. So we have our public and our private, and then we have our insured patients, and then we have medical care patients. Mean. And, you know, you've got this multi-tier, even though it's seen as two-tier, it actually turns into a multi-tier system. So yeah. what do you think from a public health point of view? How, how does this look? Can you see it affect in any health outcomes in Ireland? Oh, yeah. The, I mean, that's a huge, huge problem. I mean, we, <laughs> I've done two assignments on this already. So I'm, I'm like blue <laughs> in the face from public versus private health care. Um, but yeah, it's a huge. I mean, there's huge equity concerns there. Like you have like it, it's about equity of, of access, you know. So those with the financial means or, you know, or private health insurance um, can access faster um, and more comprehensive health care services. Um, and that that does create disparities, you know, between those who can afford private private care and then those who rely on the public system. Um, and, you're at, you know, that's how it, it's it's a regressive and it's inequitable. Um so like, I mean, you have but then I mean, yeah, I it's a huge problem because you don't have the thing is, as well, is that people think if they have private health insurance, they're going to see somebody better like they're going to see a better consultant mm -hmm. they're going to see uh somebody who's who who knows what they're talking about so like if you're an endometriosis patient and you're paying private health insurance or you can you can afford to pay out of pocket you think you're going to see a specialist but th that same consultant who can work in both the private and public sector because they're contracted a certain amount of hours to the public sector and they have to take care of a certain amount of patients like that that's that problem there right there is for endometriosis as a problem is that you think you're saying a specialist because you paid out of pocket but you could end up waiting for the same specialist and you're still going to end up in probably an inadequate surgery and someone who doesn't have the skill um to remove your endometriosis mm -hmm. so although people think that's a specialist and um, they still don't have the training and the skill uh as other specialists across the world and um, so i think it's kind of um and that and that isn't just for endo either you know like you you know people think like oh, i'm going private they're the best you know they're the best in the country they're the best in the world but like i will always always say this to people like get your records for absolutely any time you go to the doctor like even your blood results like i did that now today i was like no you can just send me the blood results i don't care that the text said everything's fine just send them to me you know and like it's not, you know, so that's like, even with that, that is a huge, huge problem in Ireland and, and massively for access, because we know that waiting times for gynecology particularly is like two, two, three, five years. Like it's so, so, and then people are sitting around for another five years wondering, you know, their pain getting worse and organs being damaged or their fertility, you know, and their, and their lives are getting worse, like constantly. And then they can't work. So they end up, you know, at home in pain with no money they're struggling to survive um both physically and economically and you know in all the ways um and they still can't access care and then by the time that they do have a diagnosis where they do need to be treated almost immediately then they have no money for a surgery or they have no money to travel abroad or you know to access proper care so it's all like this huge trickle down system and you know salon care was supposed to change that uh you know whatever their stupid comment is, right care, right place, right time or, or whatever. And they that was, you know, brought in, you know, planning in 2017 and it hasn't been implemented. None of it. Like we still don't have acute beds. CUH is at 300% capacity in the last couple of days. Like, so, you know, the, it, it hasn't been implemented and it is like the, I mean, public private healthcare system is completely outdated. We're like the only country in Europe that doesn't have free GP care. Um, you know, so people, if you don't qualify for the medical card, even if you're slightly over the bracket, but you also can't afford to go to the doctor for 60 quid, 
Um, so what are you supposed to do? Like nothing, you know? It is a crazy system and, you know, certainly coming up through the system in the sort of 90s, early 2000s, that assumption was made that if you paid to see a consultant, that that was it. You were going to get far better care than you were going to get on the public system. Um, and, you know, we certainly in the endometriosis sphere, we weren't long learning that that wasn't right. Um, you were still getting the same multiple ablations, even though you were paying 3,000 euro every time. Um as you would be had you waited on the, the public list, albeit you might get them quicker. And then you start to see unethical behavior coming in where, you know, people are brought back maybe more frequently, like for repeated surgeries or repeated treatments, you know, again, on this huge cost. And we know that absenteeism is a huge thing with endometriosis. Um, presenteeism is a huge thing with endometriosis. People are losing huge amounts of money you know, from the inability to work, the inability to actually function at work, they may have to change jobs as a result of it. Um, health insurance was an absolute luxury and still is an absolute luxury in this yeah. country. Um, and if you are look at some insurance companies, unfortunately at the minute, because endometriosis um, is most likely there since we were, you know, developing as an embryo, some are claiming that it's a pre-existing condition, which yep. is fair enough. Until you go to get cover, because then you have to wait five years before you can have any treatment for your endometriosis. Oh. Um, whereas some people don't maybe develop symptoms until maybe after they've taken out their policy. So it's yeah. very, very difficult. And it is, it's a very unequal um, sort of set and an unequal set of services as well, too. And you see where, you know, without Solanta Care coming in, that's to, as you say, it still hasn't come in. We still have this very unbalanced system where public resources are being used for private patients and that again leads to overcrowding it leads to a lot of waiting lists and it leads to depletion of resources and then the public system in terms of gp access and gp care as well too and you, you mentioned access to notes and you know access to that so you know could you take us through maybe some of the rights of, that a patient would have in that sort of situation um you know in terms of like maybe asking for their notes or you know anything like that is there anything in particular that you would you would add to that yeah, I mean, like always, I suppose, I mean, it's a very difficult thing for people to uh, come up and ask their doctor and to question their doctor, I think, you know, um, even from their GP, even if they know their GP for years, you know, like a lot of people have their GPs for a very long time, even some of them since they were children. Um, so it's somebody you knew, some, someone you know, someone that you've grown up with, um, maybe someone that's like gone through all your labors and your pregnancies and you know and they know everything about you you know and um, so I have always been very lucky in that I have had a very supportive good GP who literally always listens to me and trusts me completely Um, so I you know I brought him research like I'd say he's sick of looking at me because I bring him research I'm like you should read this Um, I come with a folder now but he um you know, so I've been very lucky in that sense uh, of having, and I know some people are also, but I also know that the majority of people really, really struggle. Um, and a lot of them have had to change GPs because they haven't been listened to or they've been dismissed. Um, but a lot of times as well, the GP isn't really the problem. Um, it's the referral to the consultant after that. So your GP, GP could be really, really good, um, like mine, and refer you and think, that they're because they don't know who they think it's a specialist so they're they're going to refer and they'll say yeah this is you know this is where you're supposed to go um even my own gp said do you want to go private like do you want to pay out of pocket i'll refer you to whoever you want you know um which i did um but you know he didn't know that they weren't actually a specialist um so that's the problem that you have so a lot of times the gp is trying to do everything to help you which they do um and i think it's awful that a lot of bad slack kind of comes back on gps because they're dealing with like i mean you're talking about babies to geriatrics you know it's mm -hmm. you know all they're looking at every stage of life how many times a day like and they're dealing with a lot of different things um so i i can't say that they can pinpoint everything i think they're after getting better with diagnosing symptoms and then referring because they don't have the skill or you know the knowledge on it they're referring to a specialist so when you get to the consultant and you're after waiting however long um you know, and and that's not working and they perform a surgery or they do a procedure and they say, yeah, yeah, your endo's gone, you know, blah, blah, whatever. 
but it isn't, you know, uh, and we know that. So I would, I always say, you know, first go, you know, just go in and say, you know, I really like my records or send the email or, you know, ring the secretary and say, I, I really like to request a copy of my records. And quite often that would be refused. And um, so we know that it has multiple times been refused, um, myself included in that. And um, so usually what you can do, depending on where your procedures or your surgeries were and depending on the hospital, uh, there's different forms. So there's a HSC formal uh, request form that you can use, but they are different for each hospital. So if like if we're in CUH, you have to request one from there and use their form. Or if you're in the South Infirmary, you have to use that form. Or if you're, you know, um, and what I have done before and what some ladies have done before is just write an email to the office of the consultant and say, you know, under the Freedom of Information Act, I request my records. And a lot of times they will send it that way because they're like, oh, crap, this person knows now. <laughs> so they're, they know they're going to get the, the official form after that. So they're like, OK, I better just do this now and send it to them. You know, and I think when people get their records like that, it's very shocking and it's very upsetting because they've been told one thing and then they've been then some stuff that they find in the records they haven't been told at all. Um, and that can be very, very traumatizing. And what I normally say to people when they ask me about that, I'm like, please have somebody with you before you open that, mm -hmm. um, even if it's your GP, but please, please have someone with you to do that because it isn't nice. It's not a nice feeling. Um, it's You find out some stuff that you really, you're happy that you know, but it can be very damaging to know that stuff went on in your body that you weren't aware of or that you felt that you didn't consent to. Um, and that and that's happened to a lot of people that I know. And it, it is very, very sad for them, even though they are happy um, that they received that information and that they know that. Um, so I would always say your records, like even blood tests from your GP, definitely, you know, always get them um, and look at them for yourself. I'm not saying, you know, self-diagnose, you know, how somebody that you have Look, to look at them for you um, or, you know, you can get basic information online or, you know, functional medicine, whatever, you know, there's people, other people that you want to ask, you know, do that. Um, but do investigate it and question. You're allowed to question doctors. You're allowed to question people who are in authority. You know, I think that we have this thing of like, oh, no, don't question, you know, like students don't don't question your teachers and, um, you know, patients don't question your doctor. It's like, don't. But they're not they're human beings like we are too and you're allowed to ask the question as to why that's happened or why is that there or why is my blood level highlighted in red but you didn't highlight that for me like why didn't you tell me about that you know you're allowed to do that um so i think that we've seen it like me and you have seen that with with endometriosis patients in ireland who are, who are more empowered who are becoming stronger who are able to go into their gps and get their referrals to treatment abroad if they want. And I've seen in the last couple of days, very young women being able to do that and being so proud of themselves for being able to do that, you know? And that that's huge. That is such a big thing. And it's such a huge positive move for patients in Ireland. Really, really is. It's a big, big change because when you think of it, we've come from very patriarchal society. And as you say, we don't question, you know, the doctor, the priest, the teacher, you know, and we're certainly starting to move away from that. And, you know, I have fantastic respect for my, my GP colleagues. There's no doubt about that because they do have a very difficult job. Um, and certainly in my early conversations with GPs, it was always around, well, how do we differentiate somebody with endometriosis and somebody who's just got period pain or maybe another pelvic condition? And that was always very difficult. And you know, always sort of say to them, look, pick the red flags. You need to ask about pain, painful sex. You need mm -hmm. to ask, did they miss their best friend's wedding? Did they miss, you know, their niece's christening? Did they miss a family wedding? You know, there's loads of things quite, where you can sort of tease those things out. And often they don't have time for that. And what's good is patients have become a little bit more empowered and educated and they're offering that information easier. But the GPs now are facing this bottleneck the extra guidelines, some of the other guidelines allow for presumptive diagnosis and medical treatment. Um, and that's treatment of symptoms, of course. And that allows GPs to start the process and stop the clock on diagnosis, which is really, really good. But then they're faced with a bottleneck. So where do we send them? What do we do? 
we know this is a stopgap situation. And certainly the GPs I've spoke to have said that, you know, this isn't a long-term solution for anybody. For some patients, you know, remaining on hormonal suppression may be a choice for contraception. It may also work very well for their cycles. But there's always that concern that they may need a follow-up as well too, or they may need just, you know, that diagnostic and treatment surgery all in one to make sure that there's not like silent kidney damage going on there, that there's not bowel infiltration or simply that it's just not, you know, maybe damage in fertility as well. So when it comes to referrals, normally you're just, you know, you're, you're stream, streamed into whatever channels available and we often don't get to choose um, the doctor that we want. And again, unless you're down the private sort of route and even at that, that's getting really difficult. Mm. So for those of us who may be want to get a referral or you maybe want to get a referral outside of the country and I know you've a lot of extensive experience around the cross border and you know can you share with us a wee bit of experience on on you know coming from both your education side and also the practical side as well of how GPs are taken to this role of now being you know able to use a cross-border directive a little bit more extensively for endometriosis now that we have um facilities for that women can actually travel to yeah, I mean, look, like we are very lucky in Ireland that we do have the cross border directive. It's a wonderful scheme. Um, it really is like you have again not just for endometriosis, but for many things. We know there's waiting lists for for so many things, especially for elderly patients. You know, and they've used it for cataract surgeries, hip replacements, and everything to go to the north and everything. And I mean, it is a wonderful directive scheme that they've done. I do have slight problems with it in so much as like you spend an absolute fortune every year on the cross-border directive like when we talk of endometriosis surgeries now and people who are reimbursed like you're talking ten thousand per patient almost that's you know that's at a maximum level but if you're talking between eight and ten thousand for like i already know six women who've been reimbursed you know up to almost ten thousand that's sixty thousand that you could have spent on our own health system you know in training and then you say oh there's no money but like, yeah, because you sent it out of the country, you know, it's like we paid for that. And now you're going to reimburse me from that, which is which is great. It's amazing. You know, I think because originally it was set up for a waiting list thing to clear that, which in itself is bad anyway. But, you know, it was to relieve that. And now, you know, we're accessing it for things because we don't have that specialist in the country. Um, The cross border directive is amazing. I think what's happening now um, and this shouldn't be the case, but. GPs and consultants are refusing referrals for cross-border directives. Um, so they, you know, and because the UK isn't part of the cross-border directive anymore because of Brexit, uh, then you obviously have to travel within Europe. But some of the countries, which, you know, a huge example, I will use Romania as an example, because that's probably one of the largest ones that Irish women use. Um, and it's one, you know, it's I personally myself use Dr. Mitroy. Um, they think it's like a, a third world country and they don't know anything about, you know, Dr. Mitroy. They don't know anything about Romania and they don't think it's safe. And then you hear the horror stories of, you know, botched surgeries in Turkey and, you know, and, and that, you know, that again, you know, makes it awful for people and to get access. But the thing like so GPs and, and consultants are now blocking that, which is another barrier to care. Um, even though every every public patient is entitled to cross border directive, um, and even the cross border directive don't specify, you know, who you can go to. They're like, you can go to whoever you want as long as your GP or your consultant refers you. Then that's fine. That's the pathway. You can do that. No problem. Um, they don't care who the doctor is. You know, like it's like so. And I, you know, I find like girls, like I just had another girl refused by her GP the other day, which is devastating for her. It's like she started the plan. She's talked to Dr. Metroy. He said, I'm going to do this, this and this. You definitely have endometriosis. I can take you this day. I can book you this surgery. Here's your date. Come this day in two months time. But now she's blocked because she can't get a GP referral. Um, Why? Like it's not, you know, they're in debilitating pain. Why is it your business where they choose to go to? Um, like I, you know, and if you're, if you are that concerned, email Dr. Mitroy, he'll answer you. 
he will answer you, you know, and he'll explain why he's written detailed letters for patients back to GPs and consultants saying, this is why this person needs special surgery. I have the skills to do this. And I mean, extensive letters. He wrote my GP, I think, a four page letter when I was going, you know, and like and my GP was like, absolutely. Yeah, no bother. You can go, you know, so, you know, barriers to care. In, in that sense and if you're providing information from the surgeon you're going to go to who he will email for you every single patient if he if you need him to and explain to the to your gp here why are you still blocking that what what is it to you that that person is trying to save their life don't you want to help them like it's it's it baffles my mind it really really does you know it and it's sad it's devastating for people it really is it's very disheartening for patients who've done a lot of reading and a lot of speaking to different people and have gone out there, you know, they've done their reading, they've done their, their research and they've come up with a surgeon, be it for whatever um, yep. condition or whatever country that they, they choose to go to. And, the, you know, the European Union, it's one of the strongest things that we have. We can all have this healthcare no matter what part of the European Union that we're in. And sort of being devil's advocate here, you can see the side of GPs and consultants maybe not wanting to refer because there is a high complication rate with some surgeries abroad. We also have the situations where people have been taken abroad by, you know, certain groups um, and maybe have had adverse outcomes. And again, the fault then comes back to the GP, a very overwhelmed GP or consultant then has to deal with the adverse outcomes. Or unfortunately, sometimes the repatriation of remains from countries. And that's the reality sometimes of, of surgeries in unregulated and unstructured ways. And unfortunately, we say that, you know, patients are traveling to Romania, they're traveling to Austria, they're traveling to Greece. We t we say that as, that's just the way we, we sort of speak in Ireland, isn't yeah. it? We, like, but we're not sending a patient to the country, we're sending the patient to an individual surgeon, an individual clinic, an individual set of healthcare professionals. And I think that's the difference. I think if we were to go into any GP in the country and say, I want to go to, you know, Romania. I want to go to the Czech Republic. I want to go to Greece for surgery. Well, They're going to look at you and go, what? Yeah. <laughs> Why? So well, and I think it's very important, I suppose, you know, and again, this is putting more work back onto the patient, but I think how you approach that conversation, how you bring in your documentation, how, you know, you're sort of saying that this is an individual surgeon who has a track record. This individual surgeon will work very closely with you to make sure that, you know, I have the appropriate care, the appropriate follow-up. They have a track history. Um, and the cross-border directive office as well to, you know, does have a collation of records where they know that patients have been. Um, and I'm sure that that would be open to GPs and consultants as well if they had a very grave concern. But ultimately, it boils down to if they're not going to sign it, the patient may end up having to find somebody else. Now, 10, 15 years ago, you could have went from one GP practice to another. At the moment, you're lucky if you can get to see your own GP, let alone try and register with another practice. So it's really, really, really complex. And we're seeing the online rise or the rise of online doctors as well to through either health insurance companies or through, you know, private paying as well to yeah. and I wonder is that going to start to have an impact as well as to how patients are seen and how they're they're sort of referred as well too. So it makes it a very, very complex yeah. process. But we do need to remember that we do have the right to be treated in any other European country. The cross-border directive was sort of separate from the National Treatment Purchase Fund, which is slightly different, but ran for a long number of years. And this is where our waiting lists were so long. We actually purchased treatment slots in private hospitals in places like, you know, the UK and Northern Ireland was used extensively and still is for some waiting lists. Um, and... It's fantastic. It does take, it takes, takes patients off the waiting list, takes patients out of suffering. But the unfortunate thing is it's a bit like having agency staff within the HSE. They're seen as a separate budget. So instead of hiring more, you know, doctors, nurses, medical scientists, radiographers, you yeah. know, you um, take in agency staff, you don't have the same overhead. So you don't have the pensionable rights. You don't have the, yeah. you don't have all of those. And that's sort of the same, isn't it, with the, the shipping out of, of people to the National Treatment uh, Purchase Fund in its day and now where people are going abroad through cross-border directives or through the treatment abroad scheme as well to yeah. the money could be invested here. There's no reason why Ireland could not be one of the leading places for yeah. 
treatment of endometriosis, we're small enough to achieve that. Yeah. Um, we have definitely have surgeons who are coming up now who are very interested in the condition. Um, and if they were available and, you know, if that was open to them to be able to specialize in something like endometriosis without having the burden of obstetrics and the full gynae workload as well, I think it would make a huge change. So and in terms of with the cross-border directive, do you find now that you're seeing patients that are, you know, are they able to access it apart from the get the signatures, but are they able to access the refunds and all the process and a lot yep. easier? Yeah, it's, I mean, to, to be fair, to run cross-border directive as well, if you are inundated with God knows what, I mean, how many, you know, how many reimbursements are, you know, people are trying to reimburse off them. Again, not just for endo, but like there's definitely an increase in endometriosis. We know that of people traveling abroad and, and accessing that service and um, so i mean they're crazy busy but again you know them and i've always found their office really really good um and helpful and they're trying to do everything like there's people in there genuinely want to help uh, for people to access care um, and they know that and that service has been used for a long time i mean i've used it two and a half years ago you know many of us and we've all been reimbursed i'm noticing that people are getting reimbursed a lot faster like so much quicker like before I think it took me nine months to be reimbursed um and then after me it started to get quicker but even the more recent ladies who got a reimburse it's been like two months and that and they're they have their money back um there's a lot of women now choosing to go for the MRI and consult with I'm going to use Dr. Mitchell as an example but going to him for for their MRI and consult and then coming home to, for prior authorization, which is something you can do with the cross-border directive to like secure a loan with the credit union or, you know, so they can secure that money and, and have it borrowed that they know that there's an assurance that the HSC are going to pay them back. Um, so, and then some people just do it, you know, to ease their anxiety or for their mind, peace of mind to kind of plan it and say, you know, this is my MRI, Dr. Mitre, they meet him first and he says, this is what we're going to do. And I suppose you have more of a kind of relationship with him, like you've met him already. Um, it's a bit more calm than the surgery. Like if you book surgery and all of that together, it's kind of, you know, steam, you're steamrolled into it and everything moves very fast. You know, so some people choose to go for the MRI and the consult first, but even those people are being pre-approved in the 20 day period. Um, so they can immediately then book their date with their surgeon and, and go, you know, so they know in two months they've secured the money um, they have their day for surgery, they've booked their flights and accommodation and they're going to be gone in two months. That's amazing. Like that's changed so much in even a year, I think, you know, um, it's a huge difference, particularly when I went two and a half years ago, it's a massive, massive difference. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, again, amazing service. And, uh, I do find, I think the only access, the barrier there is that the signatures from the referrals, you know, that won't happen from <laughs> GPs but like you said I think you know you have to go in a forum you have to self-advocate you have to be confident you have to say look this is what I want this is the reason why I want this um this is the person like print the stuff off off Dr. Mitre's website it's completely transparent he's got statistics there from every year um showing like even his complication rates which are incredibly low um, his success rate, his outcomes, the procedures that he performs, how many of them he performs, that's huge information. Um, print it, bring it and say, look, this is this is a person who's a specialist. Um, and, you know, we have to, like, give credit to to the Breast and Immunity Centre and Dr. Mitroy for breaking down the barriers to care, particularly for Irish patients. He has worked and his team have worked incredibly hard to make it so easy for Irish patients to come to him since like 2018. He's so willing to help, to learn about filling out cross-border directive forms. Um, they contacted me, oh my gosh, like a year ago to find out exactly what they needed to do to provide the information for Irish patients. And they learned that like from us, you know, me and a number of other, you know, us and a number of other advocates, like they spoke to us. That's a huge example of taking in the social determinants of health, breaking down barriers to, to access and to care and to proper care and them seeing the entire picture of an endometriosis patient's life, not just the surgery or not just I'm going to make money off that person. That's not the way they see it. Um, they see it as 
your entire life. And they're literally saving lives, but the support that you get from there and like literally the surrounding of love that you get from those people continuously, like I still do now today and even the entire time through it, I always have, you know, um, so I had huge props to, to the BEC and Dr. Mitroy, like, um, he's also doing pro bono surgeries for Romanian residents. He's just about to do his second one, I think, you know, those are huge. Like those are amazing things because we know that like Romania in general is a low income country. People don't make a lot of money. Um, you know, so he's trying to help those people. It's incredible. We have to celebrate those people because that is a huge, huge positive. And for him to do that um, for patients from a country pretty far away, even though I know a lot of Irish patients have gone there, that's incredible. And that he recognizes that and that he communicates and they communicate, you know, not just him, but his entire team speak with us all the time. You know, they speak with advocates, with Irish advocates constantly. And if there's anything they're not sure of, they question, they come and ask us. And they've changed stuff for us too, like the medical tourism facilitator. They removed that, you know, in a very short space of time when I was, when we were like, this is wrong, you know, this is what's going on here. Um, they were totally listened to us. And, you know, that's incredible. That's that's who we want, you know. Um, somebody like Dr. Mitroy. And I know there's many of those specialists around the world too i you know but like obviously he's i'm super biased and he's always going to be my hero but you know <laughs> you're entitled to personal bias on this one yeah. but believe me in public health you're going to be putting your biases to one side but uh, certainly well, you really love it the bc is certainly a great example though as you say of breaking down those barriers you know that we have in access and care and access and appropriate and timely care and the fact that they're able to combine maybe appointments together, um, you know, and, you know, within the constraints of the cross-border directive as well to and accommodate patients that way. And I think, you know, certainly when I initially spoke to Dr. Marie Joy back in 2018 and invited him to Ireland in 2019, um, the care and attention that he gave to people on a one-to-one -one basis um, at that event was was unbelievable. And we also had, you know, Mr. Chris Mann, who was there from the UK Be as there, well. Alan. And unfortunately, again, with Brexit, we lost a huge set of resources in, in the UK. And it is, it's a big loss um, because it was very accessible for people as well, too. And I think we'll probably start to see now that, you know, like other healthcare systems, we find it in Italy and France, it's a little bit more difficult, you know, to maybe access some of the surgeons there with the way their health services are set up. You know, they're not, um, it's not as easy. To access the, the the care there because you know the hospital structures are slightly different and um, their ability to take on maybe private work is slightly differently um, and to access public health care over there is, is a little bit trickier so everywhere is slightly different and I think you know Romania has turned out to be one of the most accessible ones as well mm -hmm. and I know certainly one of the criticisms that um, I've heard of of the cross-border directive and in particular in countries like Romania or Greece is that you're taking away um, a space from the population there who should be accessing it um, and certainly seeing examples you know from a lot of the endometriosis surgeons is that they do take what they can and give that back to the community within their own area and I've seen that in surgeons all of the work they will try and do some pro bono work as well too or they will be able to facilitate um, you know like through the likes of um, there is some charity set up like you know to help provide excision surgery for patients they may be able to donate surgeries through that those sort of programs so it's great to see that but we need more of them we definitely need more of them so in terms of you know we're thinking again of those sort of barriers to access and appropriate health care and you know can you sort of give me your feeling on do you think that you know women in this country have a harder time access and healthcare because we're trying to juggle a lot more going on the assumption is we can cope with a lot more so you know is there any biases that are sort of there in the system maybe that would go against women from receiving diagnosis or treatment yeah i mean it is it depends i do think like i think it's a women thing but i also think it's an age thing mm -hmm. like you like you could have two women going to the same consultant and one could be 40 or so, and one could be 20. And they'll have very different experiences of the same consultant. So I think with younger women, because maybe they don't have the strength 
they don't have the life experience. They don't have all of that to kind of feel like they need to push. Um, which we know sometimes, a lot of times, like if you're confident and you kind of push, someone will usually go, oh, maybe they know more than I think I do, you know? And that's more so if, like even asking one question, like if you ask one question and a doctor kind of goes, oh, okay, whoops, I better be careful here because uh, they know something, you know? Or you mention kind of some word, and I've said this to people too, you know, when they go into those appointments, I'm like, first of all, bring someone with you. Like even if that person doesn't say anything, they're there. You will feel from some strengths from that person that's with you. You know, if it's your partner, if it's a parent, if it's, you know, whatever it may be, it will make you stronger um, and go prepared, like write your questions, bring the research that you have, any of that, you know, and I do think that women, obviously we know that they're like pain is dismissed and, you know, you're told, you know, oh, it's normal, you know, that's supposed to, you know, you're supposed to, like, women are supposed to be in pain, like, what? I mean, you know, where are we, like, it's 2024, you know, but I do think, yeah, I think it's kind of a combination of both, of of women and then of age. Like, I think age is a very big factor in that. Um, There was another young girl the other day, and she's only 20, and she wanted her referral to, to go to Dr. Metroy, actually, and she was she was scared, and she sent me messages, and I was like, you know, bring someone with you, you're going to be fine, you're super, co- you know what you're talking about, she's learned so much, you know, really knowledgeable, um, she knows all the right things to say, but obviously gets terrified when she sees a doctor, and that, that happens to a lot of people, um, that they just get a fear of a doctor, you know, it's like... It, you're just scared because you think they know everything and a lot of them have you know god complexes so that's hard to come up against but um she went in and she was very sure and i said just be very sure that this is what you want and say this is you know be ve- just even if you approach it like that you, you might not really feel really sure but if you come across and present yourself that you are it will change a lot for you um and you know she had gotten her records and like I had gone through her records with her and we had, like I had shown her through, I was like, look at your GP here who was really far for you. I was like, look at, look at what she's done for you. Like she's pushed, she's tried everything for you. She said, you know, th- she's still in pain. She's still, and she was pushing constantly. Like every couple of months she was sending letters to these consultants saying, this girl is not okay and we need to do something for her and push and push and push. So I was like, talk to this one. I was like, you know, she's in a clinic with a couple of different GPs. So I said, try this GP. I was like, she wants to help you. You can see right here, she wants to help you. Which again is helpful for your to obtain your records because you find out stuff like that and you find out how much has your GP been fighting for you, you know? But we could see in this that this this GP was really fighting for this girl. Um, and she went in to get a referral from her and she, she was so sure. I was like, just be really sure of yourself now. Just go in there and say, this is what I want. I've done the, the work on this and I need to. And I've had loads of personal stories and, you know, whatever. And she came out and she got it. No problem. Like within 10 minutes. And she had brought her mom with her, who's like another super strong woman. And and she called me and she said, I got it. I got it. And she was celebrating. She's like, I'm so happy. Um, so And which is a great thing for her because you know what? Any other time she goes back to a doctor, she'll feel stronger because she'll remember that. And I told her, I was like, don't ever forget how you felt like that. And don't forget what you did that day to do that. Um, and you have to remember those feelings. Yeah. You have to remember those positive feelings and it will make you stronger. And and she's well empowered after that. Uh, and she knows she can do it again because she knows she can. She just did, you know, and she got what she wanted. It is amazing. And, and when, you know, people get those small wins, they can turn into something, you know, a lot stronger, a lot more healing because we know a lot of people not just those living with endometriosis, but people in general have a lot of medical trauma and that can stem from maybe childhood, you know, right up to yep. very, very recent things. And, you know, certainly those living with endometriosis are, you know, you've got years and decades maybe of not being believed, you've got years and decades of maybe being given treatments that you were not able to refuse or that you felt that you should have been on to, to sort of, you know, keep every, everybody happy because there was no other alternative available. And it is very difficult to speak up. And I often say to people, and certainly where I work, is that if you have never been that person in the gown, it's very difficult to put yourself in that place, you know. And when you put the gown on in the hospital or when you sit in the chair in the GP, the strongest advocate in the world can still sort of crumble. 
Um, and it's always important to keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, even those of us who, who shout on behalf of thousands of other people, we still can have vulnerable days when we go in. And sometimes you'll have days where the strongest advocate you can only ever be is for yourself. And that's when you start pulling in your team members, start pulling them in, you know, yeah. bring the family member, bring, you know, your support system, speak to somebody like yourself who's who's got that information to give you those tools as well to go in and arm yourself. So I think that is really important. Yeah. I suppose one sort of um, last question for you, and I suppose it would probably feed in maybe to some of your coursework as well too. So if you're to design you know, a public health initiative around endometriosis and adenomyosis. What would it look like? What would your ideal one look like? Oh my gosh, she's <laughs> we'll be here all night. So we went, oh God, you know, every time I go into a lecture and I'm like, you know, you have, because it, it kicks off your thinking, you know, and then you have, uh, you know, UCC is so funny because their whole, the motto of, of UCC is independent thinking, which I think is amazing. You know, it's like, so it's on huge science that like you're welcome past them every day. It's like independent thinking. Okay. <laughs> so like, you know, which is amazing because they encourage you to uh, be different and they encourage you to question. And they, you know, I think, I think that's a really great thing. Like most of ours aren't lectures. Like I'm not in lectures. They're, they're more discussions. It's a lot of classwork. It's a lot of work. Um, a lot of our lecturers work in the field. Um, so they're, you know, they're part-time lecturers. They literally just lecture us and then they are doing their own jobs out in, in the workplace. Um, but I mean, there's a million different things to change. Like somebody implements launch care already. Like, let's go, you know, it's like, start there. That's a huge, there are great things in that. There's things that I would change, but there are huge, that, that is, that is a huge positive thing. And it should be, it's like a whole universal social change for everybody. And it would, it would just help massively. There's really, I mean, there are problems with it, but it definitely should be implemented. Like it's a huge change. Let's break the public private system massively, like break it down. Just forget it, you know, make, separate them, just separate them um, and make it separate because then you won't have, you like you said, like the bottlenecks, that's not going to happen. You know, you have consultants who have to commit to public patients. You have to do it that way. So get those contracts out that you said you were going to get out and do that, you know, make the public contracts that they have to do that. And and then, you know, consultants will have to make decisions, you know, and somebody, for the love of God, like get some accountability here. Like, how is it that, you know, you have all these, like the cervical scandal uh, the spina bifida or it, uh, you know, all of those things. Where are those people being held accountable for that? Because that will happen again. And I'm only waiting for the time where there's enough complaints about from endometriosis patients that there's an audit done on gynecology services in Ireland. Because that will come or there will be, you know, there will be that one person who's going to break that wide open. You know, I don't know who it is yet. But it will be somebody who will have enough strength and the power and the financial means and whatever to to do that, you know, um, and that there will be that someone there will be that Vicky feeling for endometriosis, you know, we just don't know who that is yet, you know, but, you know, that's why I say to to patients now, too, it's like you have to complain, like you have to formally complain about everything, about everything that you have a problem with, any procedure, anything else like that, just just do just do that. Just complain just that one time. Um, and that will change, you know, eventually, because there will be a record of it eventually, you know. There's huge, I mean, you need an excellent center. Like we need a huge multidisciplinary sector pulling from everywhere, you know, pulling from physio, pulling from nutrition, pulling from, you know, uh, like menopause specialists from, you know, all of those things like, you know, menstrual cycles, all you know, all those people, guidance, mental health, like hugely mental health, you know. Um, and then even even support, you know, even knowing your law, your rights under the law. Um, people always kind of forget that, you know, about what you can use that way. Learn, learn the rights of the law. It's very easy to citizens advice are amazing for that. Um, you know, you can find out a lot of information from citizens advice online about your rights under the law and it is huge. Like you, those tiny bits of information, even quoting acts, um, has protected people hugely. Um, even for, you know, for surgeries, like watch your consents, um, you know, do notarize things of that you don't want done doing your consent forms before you go in for surgery or procedures. Um, I did that for a family member of mine and they were very cautious 
uh, with her surgery after that. Her treatment was some of the best I've ever seen, you know, and her follow-up treatments of that already. So learn, learn the law, learn the basic law and what your rights are as a patient under the law. You know, Freedom of Information Act is a massive one. Um, there's a couple of different ones um, for surgery, doing your consent forms um, before that. Just definitely citizens' advice are huge for that. So yeah, that's a huge part of that. You know, so so having someone to explain those things to to people, um, yeah, huge. I mean, there's so many things. <laughs> there's huge advocacy work. You know, huge like big support from government and stakeholders and NGOs and give us a load of money and we'll raise awareness and you know public campaigns and you know school campaigns and all the stuff that we need to do and that we want to do. And you know, Ireland's like one of the richest countries in the world mm -hmm. and. We're still, there's so much things wrong. There's so many things wrong, particularly the healthcare system is is a hugely massive one, you know, definitely. It is. It is. And the thing is, you know, it has potential for great change. Um, You know, they're, yeah. they're I'm biased again. I'm going to show my bias, but we do have some very good staff working within the health service and we do have very motivated people Absolutely. working within the health service. But that needs to be channeled, at least be channeled in the right way. And it's like anything, you know, through time if people don't see change to become demotivated um and i think it's always important to to sort of make sure that we know what the end goal is and the end goal within the health service is always a patient on a positive outcome for that patient as well too so i suppose orna or just to wrap up there in terms of you know living with endometriosis particularly post-surgery um, it's been a real positive for you. It's allowed you to go back to, to college. Um, it's allowed you to, you know, take on multiple tasks. You know, you're running a family, you're running the household, you're two, you know, children that you're very, very busy with as well too. Like, and then you've all your advocacy work as well too. So is there any support out there for somebody who may want to go back and maybe who, you know, may struggle a little bit um, or maybe it's pre-surgery or maybe it's a lot of symptoms? You know, are there supports for somebody who may want to back to college maybe at a later stage? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's been like it was easy for me. It's uh, for me, it's been a, it has been a huge positive experience. I probably like any of my friends haven't gone back. Like, I mean, they, some of them have gone back to do their masters and stuff like that. But absolutely, when I said I was going back, they were like, are you mad? Like, what are you doing? Um, so I, you know, like, and I was like, no, sure. I feel great. Like, sure. I feel 20 again. I'm going back there. There's no bother. Um, absolutely fine. Like, I stop. But yeah, I mean, I suppose you have to find something. It's a huge decision. And so like, if you do have a family and so obviously that's a discussion with your partner, with your children, you know, with all of that stuff, is your timing right? For me, I felt like it was perfect timing because my kids are older. Um, so by the time I finish, I have one that will finish primary school and one that will finish secondary school. So the whole timing of it worked for me. Financially, obviously, it is a bit of a struggle. Um, so obviously, I have to talk to my partner about that because he's taken over the huge, you know, and I've been working for the last decade. So um, there was two incomes. and But I will say for myself, UCC has been a massive support for mature students. Um, I have felt like completely helped there and supported um, constantly checked it not just financially but even as a student I suppose as a mature student um, like I'm the only mature student in my course um, so and I'm double their age so you know like it's a, it's a bit of crack um, but they could be my kids um, <laughs> but you know so it's and I couldn't you know I could reach into the mature student you know mature students kind of they just go to college they do their classes they go home you know it's it's that kind of thing but I've had huge financial support from UCC and they have an excellent mature student office um, I would, you know, I reached out to them several times before I even applied to the course. They were completely helpful. They told me all of the financial supports. Um, like I've had help with um how to write assignments, um, how to use your know, different digi digital um tools, um, referencing tools, all of those. I was taught again, you know, um, incredibly helpful. Um, always supportive, always checking in. And if you find something that that you really know that you're going to love um, and that you really, really want to do and there's a massive reason behind it, then absolutely go for it. Like we only have one life, you know, and you can always go back no matter what age you are. And as long as, like, I really love this course. Like it's, it's absolutely everything I love um, and I picked it well. <clears throat> so I would say 
research a book of modules if you're thinking of a course and like break it down and be like, can I do this? Or is it something that I'm really interested in? And research that massively and what, you know, what you could do after it. I mean, in public health, it's probably one of the best times to go into it. One, because of COVID. Thank you, COVID, for the one thing that you gave the world. Um, but and because, you know, people kind of understood what public health was then. And also, it's just a good time. You know, it's a good time to that. There are a million jobs that I could do after after I finish um, in a number of different um you know, sectors like there's huge, like you could do a million different things. So, you know, there is jobs out there. Um, probably, you know, a lot of people leave the country that a lot of people end up working for WHO and um, they end up doing a lot of um, working in detention centers or they, you know, they go to Africa, they work there. Yeah, there's loads to do. Um, I'd probably want to do a load of data analysis and epidemiology <laughs> to try and find some statistics on endometriosis patients. But um yeah, and I certainly, you know, my goal was to always do more for the Irish endo community um, and to change, to make a change here in this country um, because it is incredibly important and there's so many people that need us to do that. Um, and you've been on your own for long enough, so you need more people behind you. I think. <laughs> and That's so true. Yeah, and gather a larger tribe, which I think is growing and we've seen that, you know, so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's something that you want to do, and definitely do it. Yeah, for sure. That's fantastic. It's so encouraging because I've I've known so many women over the years where they ended up making a different educational or career choice due to living with endometriosis, and you know to see that not only you can go back and do something, be brave enough to go back and do something, but you know there are supports available. There is options open to people yeah. as well too. And there is life after endometriosis surgery. And Absolutely. it may, we're never going to be the same 100% as, as you know, maybe like the 20, 21 year olds like in the college. <laughs> but there are options and there, there are ways of doing it, you know. Orna, Absolutely. it's been fantastic speaking to you again. And we oh, certainly, you, you know, could could speak for another few hours as well too. Yeah. But uh, we look forward to chatting to you again. And yeah. just want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. And uh, we'll catch up with you again soon. Mm-hmm.